the money that comes from it. There are lots of folks that are starting to help us on the front end, and we want to be grounded in who we are so that we make the right decisions. And we're hoping that this conversation today can kickstart a conversation about how are we going to get this building, how are we going to maintain this building, and how are we are going to make it in an image that makes sense uh, for us to use forever. So I met Maulana when I was 19 years old. Whoa. I'm, I'm a lot older than 19 years old. <laughs> and when you hear Project New Village, so that we know, and I'm saying this publicly, folks with phones and things like that, the infrastructure of Project New Village is built on the foundation of Coweta uh, philosophy. We have values that ground us in what we do. And so I'm appreciative and going to ask Tom Bluzi, who was the connector, if you will, with me and, and Maulana, to come and introduce Maulana here today because it is a wonderful thing. And again, it's kicking off the next leg of our journey to be rooted in terms of what we do uh, with Project New Village. Thank you. Now, I can, first of all, I just want to say welcome to everybody. But that, no, this is this is an African event. It's going to be scholarly. You're going to learn something. But it's okay. an African event, which means that it's participatory, right? We've got some of the best black men and women in San Diego. You have it right here today, and we got to act like that and show it. You know what I'm saying? And I'm gonna ask you, Kamal, because I see some people circling around looking. If you can just yes, sort of be a, a, a lookout for us out, out there. The parking is good in the back, but it don't look like it from the front. But here we are. First of all, I want to just say I'm honored to introduce my leader and chair, Dr. Avon Green. Without him, I wouldn't be the person that I am. And as we said in the 60s, we used to say, if we've done anything of value or anything of beauty, it's because of this uh, Malana, because of our philosophy, Kawaita, which is a synthesis of the best of African thought and practice in constant exchange with the world, and because of the dedication of the advocates of our organization, men and women who have dedicated their life to pushing forward black people and putting them as a priority. So without further ado, Dr. Malana Correa is professor and chair of the Department of Africana Studies at California State University, Long Beach. Dr. Correa is the creator of the Pan-African Cultural Holiday Kwanzaa and the Guzo Saba, the seven principles that this month again he was referring to. The author of the authoritative text titled Kwanzaa, a celebration of family, community, and culture. An activist scholar, he's also a chair, chair of the organization Us and the National Association of Kawaii Organizations, and the Executive Director of the African American Cultural Center and Kawaii Institute of Pan-African Studies, and also co-chair of the Black Community Clergy and Labor Alliance, BCCLA. And I should just say for the historical record that KIPAS, the Kawaii uh, Institute of uh, Pan-African Studies, was started right here in San Diego. And that's right. Class, and I want to give that, that's our credit yeah. for that. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. is also the author of numerous, uh, numerous scholarly articles and books, including Essays on Struggle, Position and Analysis, Kawaii and Questions of Life and Struggle, Mott, The Moral Idea in Ancient Egypt, A Study of Classical African Ethics, Introduction to the Black, the Introduction to Black Studies, the fourth edition, and the Odu Ifa, The Ethical Teachings. He is currently writing a book on the social, we can't go for it, social and ethical philosophy of Malcolm X titled The Liberation Ethics of Malcolm X. Critical consciousness, moral grounding, and transformative struggle. Dr. Karim is the recipient of numerous awards for scholarship, leadership, and service, including the Paula, Paul Robeson Zora Neil Hurston Award for scholarly work, significantly contributing to the understanding, development, and appreciation of world African community, and the CLR James Award for outstanding publication of scholarly works that advance the discipline of Africans, uh, African and Black studies both from the National Council of Black Studies. He is also, and everyone should get this book, he is also the subject of a book by Dr. Moleke Asante, Asante titled, Marlana Karenga, An Ethical Portrait. Please, give us, help join me in giving a strong wrong. I'm sorry. I want to do that again, Asante, to you. Well, this is a good lesson, let's just be, go back and you fix it. And Asante for that. It is also the subject of a book, he is also the subject of a book by Dr. Molefe Asante titled, Maulana Karenga, An Intellectual Portrait, which give, join me in giving a, wrong, a warm round of applause to our speaker who will be talking on taking a seat at the table, life, food, and the earth, 
and the just and justice for everyone. Dr. Malawani Chris. <laughs> On behalf of our organization, us and the African American Culture Center, on behalf of my house, my wife, my friend, my companion, and all things good and beautiful, Samoya Renga, I want to thank uh, you. I want to thank uh, Ms. Nini Kiro Moss, the managing director of Project New Village, and Mr. Robert Tambuzi, a member of the board of directors. A project, uh, New Village, and many others involved in uh, sending out and giving this invitation to me and Timurin to come and share with you uh, in this conversation. Uh, and I changed it a little bit. Instead of taking a seat at the table, I'm going to be taking a place at the table because I want to build on Daniel uh, Caden's conversation about place making, which is actually an ancient Egyptian concept related to the creator who stepped out and made place. Yes. So one of his praise names is placemaker. Yes. One who makes place. And that's a very important thing that whenever we're going to do things, we have to make a place for it, right? And so it's taking a place at the table, right? And then life, food, the earth, and justice for all. And what I want to do in that is talk about how important for us it is to show agency, to show the will and ability to act, to choose and to act, and to do things that, as Odu Ifa said, brings good in the world, sustains good in the world. And certainly in this complexity of issues that we as a people, a country, and the world faces, we need to be able to have a place at the table, not only to eat, but to make decisions. Yes. Yes. And to commit ourselves, to recommit ourselves, to struggle, to bring into being the good world we all want and deserve to live in. And so I just wanted to start up. Some, some of this I'm going to read some of this talk out, but I think it's important for framing, all right? So in the complexity of the continuing critical issues that confront us as a people, a country, and a world community, the interrelated concerns of uh, and the struggle for life, food, the earth, and justice remain central to everything we do. Listen to that now, food. Without food, we can't even Go forward, rescue me if I'm wrong, right? But food is what? A substance for life. So we have to respect life. Just showing you. And then the earth, the earth is the base, the place in which we make ourselves, in which we bring ourselves into being. Because we have to bring ourselves into being. Again, the old Ephi sacred text of our yoga ancestors said that if you are given birth, Mm -hmm. You must bring yourself into being again, right? You must make yourself into what you want and need to be. In fact, what you ought to be, right? And you have to choose to be the best of yourself. And as Garvin, as Adam Marcus Garvin said, we must struggle always to come into the fullness of ourselves. So that African means excellent. If African, we say in Kawaita, means anything, it must mean excellent. So if you're an African, you're supposed to just right from jump straight. Strive for excellence in all you do. In fact, that is what the book of Potatu said, <laughs> that we should strive for excellence in all that we do. And so I'm focusing, even though I'm focused because of the project, New Villages um, project, right? I focus on food. All of this is interrelated, right? As I told you, food is related to life. Life is related to the earth. The earth is related to our own struggle for justice for the earth and all in it, right? And so I, there is both in thought and practice <coughs> evidence 
that some groups, some people, don't get not only enough food, but enough justice. Indeed, justice and food are distributed according to a lot of social attributes. Race, mm -hmm. class, gender, sexuality, religion, age, ability. Yes. All of these things determine what you get in life, right? And so what I want to do is to argue that, to deny people, groups, persons, food and other necessities of life is to demonstrate a depraved disregard for human life. Therefore, there's the uh, indispensable and vital starting point for any discussion about human life and pardon me, about human activities and human concern is the ethical issue and rightful struggle for food, justice, and other um, necessities is to start with the respect for the human person. If we don't have respect for the human person in all their diversity, right, regardless of race, class, gender, sex, sexuality, uh, religion, age, ability, etc., then we don't even have a conversation. If you don't respect them, what kind of conversation can we have? Right, excuse me if I'm wrong, right? So we have to start with that. And in our text, the ancient uh, Husea of ancient Egypt, the sacred text of ancient Egypt, humans are defined as images of the divine and bearers of dignity. This concept of being an image of the divine, this concept of having dignity is key to all that we talk about. Because dignity means an inherent worthiness, right? That we are worthy by being born human, right? And that dignity, the ancient Egyptians called it shepesu, this internal worthiness has three characteristics to it. First, it is transcendent of all those attributes I talked about, all the social attributes. Whatever biological attribute or characteristic you have, whatever social aspect or attribute you have, dignity trumps all that. I'm sorry to use that word. But it, it goes beyond all of that, right? So no matter what you are in your difference, in your similarity, everybody has an inherent word they are born with. So it is transcendent, number one, it is transcendent of all social biological attributes. Second, it's equal in everybody. Without distinction. Nobody has more dignity, inherent worthiness. No one is more worthy in life than the other person. And third, this is what our ancestors taught. And third, it's all in inalienable. That means nobody can take it from you. But it also means you can't give it away. <laughs> it can't be taken from you, and you can't give it away. So we start with that because without appreciating people's humanity, then the conversation that Nanya Cable had about being fair to people doesn't even arise. You don't need to be fair with them if you don't respect them. If you have a depraved disregard for them, you can shoot them down in the street yeah. and call it justice. That's right. Rescue them if I'm wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to be clear that that's the starting point. The starting point is respect for human beings in all their diversity. Disrespect for human worthiness and dignity of human beings is at the same time a respect for human life, seeing it as sacred, right? And protected against all forms of desecration, devaluation, and violation. I said sacred. That is to say that you value it, you protect it against all forms of devaluation. Did you hear that? Desecration and violation. You don't do anything to violate the sacredness of the human person. In fact, you build on it. So we're talking about building a project, a village, a food district, and we put humans at the at the center of it, at the center of it, and in this case, African humans, but also others. But we got we, we got at one point we got to talk about black people. Oh, <laughs> yeah. We can't explode ourselves out of existence. Yeah. 
Let's keep it about wrong. We can't be black, you can mix this. We just Ooh. gotta be black. Right? <laughs> we gotta be black, right? If we don't be black, we don't have no case. You can't say the white man is doing something to you because you're black, and you just said you're not. Mm. Make up your mind, black people. Come on. <laughs> you got to be yourself in order to free yourself. And if you don't be yourself, you'll never free yourself. Let's give it by wrong. So, so um, if we, <laughs> if we uh, protect the human person against all forms of desecration, devaluation, and violation, this also means that people not only have a right to life, but also a right to the necessities of life. Ain't no need to say if people got a right to life, and then you're killing them by denying them necessities of life. Yeah. And at the basic, everybody has a right to food and water and clothing and shelter. Just, just at the minimum, right? Mm -hmm. But they also have a right to health care. Yes. yes. Adequate health care, right? They have a right to recreation. They have a right to work, right? To employment. Gainful ways to, you know, take care of themselves and to live a life of dignity and decency. Can't say you respect human dignity, then you don't give them the condition to live a dignified life. So clearly there are many definitions of justice and social justice, right? I mean, there's a lot of ways people talk about social justice. But what I want to do is use a Kawahita. My Kawahita is my philosophy. And my philosophy defines itself as an ongoing synthesis of the best of African thought and practice in constant exchange with the world. So I try to get the best of what our people thought throughout the years and in all places Africans live, and I try to put it into a coherent whole so that it represents the best of what we thought and done throughout uh, the centuries. And so if I take that and I'm talking about justice, I want to talk about justice as <clears throat> conditions of society, conditions of society that ensure that persons and people receive their rightful due as human beings. And this includes at least four basic things, four basic conditions. Number one, respect for the equal dignity and rights of the people. Second, equality of treatment and of access to the necessities of life and the opportunities of life. All right? So again, equality of treatment and equality of access to the necessities of life and to the opportunities of life. That's number two. Dude, this is, these are just aspects of justice. So justice is not just a concept, but it's a practice. Yes, That's right. right. And it's right. a condition. It's a condition that we're going to build on in order to get a capacity, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Because justice has two aspects to it, conditions and capacities. You can add a condition and don't add a capacity, then it don't work. I'll, talk, I'll tell you about that in a minute. So the third thing is equity and diversity. So that sometimes when people talk about justice, they talk about a procedure justice. For example, if the white man, and you know, I still say white people, you know, yeah, yeah. I just say it out. You know, so people won't be scared to say white, or scared to say black. You know, white people, white people can shoot you in this. What well, me? If white people, the police, the police, okay? Sometimes the police, they can go out and pick you up. They just target you, pick you up, arrest you. And then you say, I haven't done anything. They say, well, wait until the trial. You can say that. Yeah. So then they do this. It's procedure justice. Number one, they give you a lawyer if you don't have the money. It might not be the best lawyer, no. but no. it's a procedure, and they give it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that guy might try to, or the woman might try to get you to plead right away. So right away. You <laughs> but you got a lawyer. You can't argue. You got it. Did the procedure say give you a lawyer? They didn't say what kind of lawyer. Second, if they give you a speedy trial. Now, if that speed is up to them, right? Yeah. You, they didn't even told you speedy in two days, three days, four days. That speed can be changed, depending yeah. upon yeah. what you say and they do in your lawyer. And third, if you have a trial, 
And if you are convicted, that's still justice. You might be let off and they'll say, that's justice. But neither one of those is justice. Neither your conviction nor your exoneration is justice. You know what justice would be? Not even picking you up at all. Because you didn't do nothing. Didn't do nothing. <laughs> so here you got a condition called court or legal justice, but you don't have the capacity to exercise it because they criminalized your race. First they racialized crime, called them black, black on black crime, you know that. They don't say white on white crime, no. just black. So once they get you to concede and call black, call crime black, they can, that's called racializing crime. And once they racialize crime, they can criminalize the race. Make the whole race suspect. You can follow them in the store even if they got a billion like Oprah. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Rescue me if I'm wrong. That's that's right. You can do what you want to them as a result of law and socially sanctioned practice. Okay? So again, I, I you know I didn't went far afield. I was going to give you four things I want to <laughs> <laughs> Not really, though. I just want you to understand. I don't want to put down this concept and, you know, you know, you, you like it, but you ain't righteously got it together. So I'm trying to be as thorough as possible. Okay? Is that good? Yes. Okay. Sign for that. Sign for that. So I told you equity and diversity. We, we have to be treated differently because we got an unequal burden of oppression. That's right. More than anybody else with the exception of Native Americans. Nobody knows anything about the Native Americans. So I, when I say that, I, somebody might say, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, but that's in terms of the statistics. Native Americans got worse statistics. Oh, yeah. But guess what? We encounter the white man every day. Every day. So he does more to us everywhere and all the time mm -hmm. in a certain sense, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't want to ever minimize the suffering are the resistance of Native Americans. I always want to pay homage to them. So equity in the person. Sometimes when people say, well, everybody got an opportunity. But everybody got an opportunity, but some people have been held down. <laughs> so we, we're going to call a race, right? This is a white man. He called a race. He done ate this morning. He's ready. He got all the track shoes he needs and everything. He got coaching. Then he tell you, start running. Now, he done had you tied up for 400 years. That's right. Mm -hmm. The circulation is bad. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Your legs have atrophy. You know what I'm saying? So he tells you, run around the track. Hey. No, no. We need, first of all, we need medical care. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. We need to get back in shape, right? And we need to be, I don't, I don't know how, what they call that, spotting. You know, like when you go around the track, it's a good example of equity. You ever notice when they go around the track, some people are further out front than others? Right. The people that have less to run inside, they're put back. And the people that are way on the outside, they're put ahead. Right. For the stagger. 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 All right. Thanks for that. <laughs> that stagger represents equity in diversity. That's right. Uh, See, when you've been on the outside all the way up there, you got more than run, you got to get some kind of head start. That's what they got head start from. That's what they got affirmative action from, right? Yes, yes. You got to clean up what you done done for 400 years. You can't tie people up, bind them, chop one of their legs off, and tell them run fast as I do. Why aren't you running faster? Right? But if you have a depraved disregard, for human rights and human dignity, you'll do something like that. And the oppressor does that every day without any sense of remorse. No. Mm -hmm. The fourth thing is we must have, and then you gave me talked about this earlier, we must have effective participation in public life, especially in decisions and activities that affect our destiny and daily lives. People have no right to meet at a table and decide our life, and we're not present. That's right. In some meaningful way, right? We all can't be at the table, right? But we got to have rightful representatives. And even if we got a representative, he or she's not doing nothing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, seeking a comfortable place, <laughs> position in oppression, yeah. then we got a problem, right? 
So the evidence shows us an outcome of these conditions that if there to be good conditions, then it must be expressed in people having the capacity to do these things. One, to live lives of well-being and fruition. That's how I know the conditions right. If I if I'm I'm living a life of well-being and fruition, not only am I just eating, but I'm growing and developing and thinking and hoping and aspiring and building, right? It's not just about eating. It's but we can only come to this kind of conversation after we eat, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I said this one time in one of my articles. Uh, humans don't live by bread alone, but they can only come to that conclusion after they eat, yeah. right? Yeah. You get real philosophical on a full stomach, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, But if you're hungry, right, you tend to focus on food, right? Yeah. So the first thing is that if the conditions are right and rightful and just, then we have the capacity to live lives of well-being and fruit. Second, the capacity to pursue our concepts of good. All of us got a concept of something we would like to do. Is that fair to say? Yes. We ought to have the ability to do that, to become what we want to be, to come again into the fullness of ourselves. And third, now this is very important here because sometimes this is left out in an individualistic society, a vocally individualist society. We should also do this in mutual respect, caring and community and cooperation with others. We have to do this in mutual respect, caring, community, and cooperation with others. We can't. The, the project that um, Nathan Hammond talked about, guess what? If we don't have it in the context of community, it ain't going nowhere. Yeah, true. Yeah. It could be a nice thing, and actually she could get it all. All she needs is some money. That's all. But that's not what she want to build, is a building. No. She don't want another business. No. Right? She wants a community. A food district that at its heart is a caring community, a cooperating community, a community that respects and cares for each other. Mm -hmm. That's that's yeah. what she wants to do with this new project village, right? This food district within the project village, right? And a lot of times people don't want to put emphasis on that. They just want to fill out forms. <laughs> Get the money, you know what I mean? Say the right thing. Go over there with your hat in the hand and expect kindness from the strangers. Funds and favors. I've said this about black leadership, you know? Like one of the things that happened since the 60s with black leadership spends much of its time away from black people. That's right. And in the corporate world, seeking funds and favors from the white people. <laughs> Rescue me if I'm wrong now. In fact, they don't know how to talk sometimes to black people, right? They just know they need to say, and every year that's some new terminology you got to get. Yeah. You know, you got to learn uh, uh, grant language. Yeah, yeah. yes. And you got to focus on what they, so all of a sudden now, the Haitians have been the most abused immigrants. And we never talked about it. But the Europeans decided that the Latinos are the new focus. So y'all got to talk about Latino immigration. And they can talk about Latino immigration. And guess what? You don't ever mention the Haitian or the continent of Africa. That's right. Or any of the other Caribbeans. Now, you know, I'm not against Latinos. You know that. I was in an alliance with Latinos in the 60s when they didn't have a serious population, right? So that, we're not even talking. I always argued for third world unity. Yes, sir. Anybody that knows me know that. Yes, sir. But I'm black, by the way. Notice? Yes. So I got to be for black first. Yes. That's garbage. Way first. Yes. Yes. If I'm not for myself, how can I ask anybody else to be for me? If I don't respect myself and my interest, how do I present that to other people in a dignity-affirming way? in a life-enhancing way. 
wife, I'm talking about how we cannot let our oppressor be our teacher or our allies be our tutor. Mm -hmm. We must speak with our own special, we must speak our own special truth. Come yes, here. Yes, we yes, must yes, speak yes. our yes. own right. cultural right. truth. And we must make our own unique contribution to how this society is reconceived and reconstructed. Now, I have, I have, in my title, I say, taking, uh, taking a place at the table. So what does this mean, taking a place at the table? I have self-consciously and intentionally chosen to use the concept of taking a place at the table rather than simply sitting at the table or accepting a seat at the table that somebody else gave us. That's a very important thing. I'm going to say this again. Taking a place at the table rather than sitting at the table and accepting a seat at the table given to you by somebody else. If they give it to you, guess what? Come they on, take it from you. Right. You got to take the table. All right? Now, the, the reason I want to take mm -hmm, is I want to stress two things, agency and struggle. If we're going to build this project new business, we're going to build this food district, we got to have agency. Agency and we got to struggle. Now, what is this agency thing? It's from the Latin word that means to act, but it's more than that. When you talk black, it's more than just acting. Yes, yes, yes. It's choosing. It is the ability and will to choose and act. That's what I mean by agency. I'm going to say it again. Agency is the will and ability to choose and act. A lot of times black people have the ability, but they don't have the will. And a lot of times, they want to act without thinking and reflecting and choosing the best path forward. Let's get it done, y'all. Come tired of all this talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where is that come from? off in you. Now, you know we're going to talk. Why you come off in you and say, you're tired of talking? If you're tired of talking, show us that by you stop and talk. Yeah, yeah. You don't even say that. you tired of talking, and you need to talk. The rest give him a bubble. They're not really tired of talking, you know? They just want to say something. <laughs> want to get to jump on somebody, you know? That's not even real. You save that for our oppressor. We got to talk. Yeah. And we got to reflect and think deeply about things. We got to get together and talk, dialogue, which I'm going to do when I get to the table, all right? So this means uh, uh, agency, as I said. This means that to achieve food justice, food security, and food sovereignty, we must choose to pursue and achieve these goals. We must choose to act. We must choose to sacrifice. We must choose to dedicate ourselves. If we don't do that, hey. And you and I know it's hard to choose, right? It's easy to follow a routine. Are y'all there with me? Yeah. We got to choose to build Project Village. We got to choose to build the food district. We got to choose to spend twenty dollars a day, she said. And we got to choose to get a thousand people to do that. We got to choose. Choose to be free in order to be free. Harriet Tubman told us to choose when she said, guess what? We must go free or die. That's it. And freedom is not bought with dust. In other words, it's not cheap. Yeah. It's not dirt cheap. Yeah. You're going to get it, it's going to be cost and casualties. So you got to be ready for it. So we got to sacrifice to see this through, right? That means choosing. Choosing to act. Choosing to sacrifice. Choosing to dedicate. Choosing to volunteer. We got to choose like me. And because all this choosing and acting will encounter, it will encounter obstacles in the very structure of the country and the city and the state, then we must overcome them through righteous and relentless struggle. There is no alternative to struggle. 
Everybody that just wants things to happen, hoping you can go to a meeting, they just hug you and tell you, I've been wrong all these years. <laughs> <laughs> I've cheated you out of your money, I've cheated you out of your labor, I've enslaved you, I've segregated you, I've practiced vicious lynching against you. They're not going to do that without trouble. Same with reparations. How many of y'all believe we should have reparations? That's right. I know it. I know it. They owe us. They owe us, right? They owe us everything they got. Everything. But they're not going to give it up. And only by struggle will we even get a measure of what we do. So what about this table? Taking a place at this table. I want you to reconceptualize table, and I want you to see it in at least three basic ways, all right? So, um, to take a place at the table has multiple meanings, a concept uh, as it is used here. Uh, and it means um, to first to take a place, to take a place means to grasp it. To hold it in your hand, to take second, to assume possession and power. See? So first it is to grasp it. That means to seize it. You gotta, you gotta just take your place. I mean, you gotta seize your place at the table. Don't let people give you a place. Go in there as if it's your right already. That's right. Yeah. Right? And that the struggle of your ancestors. And the struggle you've engaged in today means you've won this. You've earned this, they say. say you'll do this, right? Then the second thing that it means is to assume possession and power of it. See, you can have a place at the table, but if you don't assume possession and power of it, yeah. guess what? Somebody will be sitting in your seat. You, right. you ever thought you had a seat somewhere? And you get up in there, and somebody else is sitting there. I asked you a question. Have you ever had that? Yes. Yeah. That has been happening for hundreds of years. The imposter is in our seat. Come on. Yes. Pretending he's us. Pretending he's our representative. Pretending we don't need any representative but him. We got to take possession and power of our team. Is that fair to say? Yeah. That's yeah. super yeah. Yeah. Too yeah. Power, right? right? The next thing, and this is key here, we must assume it to take it. All these words in English mean take. So take means to grab and hold, right? Or grasp and hold. Assume power and, and possession. But it also means to assume the right and responsibility for something. I take responsibility, you say, right? That's assuming responsibility for you. So if you're going to take a seat, you got to say, I take it as a right and a responsibility. Okay. It's our right, but it's also our responsibility. That's right. That's right. So if you want to get at the seat, mm -hmm. you can't just sit there smiling. <laughs> you got to struggle to get it, you got to struggle to hold it. Uh -huh. Now, to take a place at the table, calls for an expansive concept of the table. So what does the table mean? First, it means obviously a place where we gather to share food. We need to be at that table where people are eating. That's right. Everybody else is eating, why are we? Why are Africans all over the world? Come on. Why are we suffering from hunger, malnutrition, and even famine? Yes. That's enough word. food in the world to feed everybody. Do you know that one third of the food produced is wasted? Yes. We live in a consuming, throwaway society where people have too much to eat, more than they want or need, and they just keep possessing and acquiring because acquisitiveness is part of a capitalist consumer society. In fact, we're taught to feel empowered by being able to buy somebody's product. Mm -hmm. It becomes a substitute for freedom and for production yourself. 
So its mind is buying a lot of times. So the table is first a place, I said, to gather and share food. Second, it's a place where we share ideas, where we dialogue and make decisions about our lives, our work, and our future. So that's the decision table, the dialogue and decision table. You got to be there. You can't just be at the eating table. You got to be at the decision making, the dialogue table, the collaboration table, the planning table. And third, this is equally important, the table is a place where we struggle us, <clears throat> where we struggle on our own or or with coalition or in coalition and alliance with others. So first of all, so it's a place where we struggle on our own or in alliance and coalition with others and in opposition to those who would hold those who hold views and support policy negative not only to our lives but also detrimental to the world. So it's a struggle, it's a site of struggle. The table is a site of struggle. Y'all see that? That's where the policy is making I'm talking about. So I done went to three different tables. Your home table where you eat, or the communal table where you eat. Second, the table where we gather around like now and talk about issues, right? But then there's a table where policy is being made. Yes. That's what you got to say. And you got to go there and make either struggle by yourself, because sometimes you don't have no allies. They got something else they want to do, right? You might have to take on everybody. Come on. But yeah. it's better if we struggle in alliance and coalition, right? Yeah. But don't be afraid if you have to build the coalition at the table. They came with one idea and you convince them of another. You got to struggle is what I'm telling you, black people. Because sometimes black people, <clears throat> and, and another thing, don't get mad if people don't hug you every time they see you. <laughs> so a lot of times black people, <laughs> and I understand it, because you know, we're feeling people, right? We want people to like us, we want to like them. But guess what? They've been hugging us, and even going to bed with some of us, uh -huh. and it hasn't changed our status. Now, what is it? I'm going to divert this one moment. Then I'm going to have to give up so we can have a conversation about this. Uh, the rest of it, I'm just outlining. <clears throat> have you noticed on television, we got more and more integration? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's two or three things about it. First of all, it's giving you the idea, if you accept it, that progress is being made. But that two or three points that you should consider before you come to that conclusion. Number one, the white man has been doing it to the black woman and the man since we came in contact with him. Rescue me if I'm wrong. We got time for discussion if you want it, so there's no progress of putting it on television. Second, have you noticed that they leave the black man out? Yes. It's just another way to kill the black man and to demonstrate he's not even worthy, not just to have his woman, but his children. Mm -hmm. His children are smiling in the face of the oppressor. That's my position. Yeah. I don't think we can love freely in an unfree situation. I don't think we can choose freely or not as free as we need to free in an unfree situation. So don't give me all that. We need wealth, we need power, and we need an alternative status. Yes. Wealth, power, and status. If your wealth don't change, your status don't change, and your power don't change, ain't no progress being made. Okay. Did y'all hear that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you agree, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's important here to realize that <clears throat> it's at that table of struggle that's important because if you don't be at that tough, tough, you miss the struggle that determines, if you don't be at that table and in that struggle, you miss the struggle that determines in great part, number one, how we eat. Second, what we eat, how much we eat, and even where we eat. 
Now that's cold right there. Yeah. I just want to eat a, end on a food note. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so when Yankee Kids were in Project Village and Top Movie, and they were doing these gardens and trying to do CSA or community su supported ag agriculture, it's in opposition to agro um, I <laughs> agro corporate farming or industrial farming. Right? Who is concerned only with profit and what they call efficiency. So they make up food for you. And a lot of times when I say you have enough too, look, they make up food. They got monster seeds. They change the way people are structured. Now, let me tell you this. Now this is just uh, what do you call so many cable had in her literature about telling your narrative, right? You know that's key. You gotta tell some black people gotta tell their story. That's right. Then our story is our history, and then our history is our humanity. Right? So we have to tell our story. So I'm talking my story about what I see. When I first came out here, I came out here in uh, uh, 50, 52. I, I went to uh, Los Angeles, and I went back in a, uh, uh, in a year, and I came back to go to UCLA, but I didn't have enough money. So the established resident, I went to City College. A good thing. I, I'm glad I went there first. Because mm -hmm. UCLA was like, you know, a factory kind of thing. But when I came out here, I was just impressed with all the different kinds of people, especially third world people. I knew white people. We met them all the time. But I just saw all the other kinds of Native Americans, Latinos, Asians, right? And they look different. Now everybody, this is anecdotal now, everybody looks the same. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> I don't even know if it has nothing to do with food. <laughs> but I got a healthy suspension. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just, just think about it. Not only do they structurally look the same and talk the same, did it? Everything that I admired about cultural diversity is being erased. And all we have is this homogenous, monotonous conversation from the dominant group. Yeah. One time, black people used to stand out. We, one time, you know, we had our church, we had our music, right? We had our color, we had our rhythm. And we had something that was sacred called soul. Soul. Yeah. We had soul men, soul women, soul day, soul train, soul food. <laughs> Let's give up. Soul, soul. We had soul, soul session. session. Yeah. And then they started giving awards for soul to white people. Yeah. You might think this don't have nothing to do with food, but it does. Yeah. You know why? Because. We will be to the, value, the beautiful uniqueness, the equally valid and valuable way of our being human in the world. Each people is a unique and equally valid and valuable way of being human in the world. Right. And we don't need to lose that special thing that makes us who we are. Nor should we let people talk us out of it by saying we got 50 different other identities. Well, you know, tell that to the oppressor, right? He don't recognize all that unless he wants to manipulate you and divide you from your people and talk about your people oppressing you, right? Let's give it back wrong now. You don't have a question that you can, you can raise it with. So what I want us to do is, uh, when I say that they determine how we eat, I mean, whether we eat in self-determined ways and self-producing ways, and whether we define the way we do it or allow agro corporations that dominate agriculture and determine policy and practice concerns. When I say they determine what we I mean whether it's healthy food or harmful food, whether it's organic or monster seed food, you know what I'm saying? How much we eat. That means they determine whether there'll be a scarcity or abundance. Mm. Yeah. Right? Sufficient quantities for us or insufficient quantities. And they determine where we, and this is gold here, whether we eat in our own homes and communities, 
or find ourselves eating in places designated for those who have been denied the capacity to do so for themselves and bear it with. They structure why we have to go to get food. And so we learn not to see ourselves and give it to from you. Let me just run across here. I, 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 I'm not going to do the rest of this. I want to say what, there's a quote I, I got from what Mindy Kim said. She said, we will work together to redirect the impact of systemic inequities and to establish non-exploitative and life-affirming food ways. That means, uh, black people, that we must rethink, reconceptualize how we relate to food and struggle, how we relate to the earth even. You know, one of the things, I, don't, I wish I had time, to, you know, this is a, we really need a seminar for this. But one of the things I wanted to talk about is our alienation from the land. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, when the Europeans, we talk about land and uh, want to go back and all that. <clears throat> they have a whole different kind of concept, saving the trees and all that. But what we, because we were oppressed on the land, and, and I'm talking for myself here, right? I'm, a, I'm from a farm in the eastern shore of America, right? I grew up on a farm. I picked tomatoes and got up potatoes and, you know, picked watermelon, cantaloupe, cucumbers. It's called pickles, you know. So when I came out here, I kind of put that behind me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but I'm intellectual, so I don't give it all up because I see it related to my mother and father, who love farming. Mm -hmm. They love their relationship with the land. They, even when they didn't own land anymore because of a lot of things, they built a garden and tended the garden and love to see things grow. And walk me and my, I, my, my siblings in the woods to look at plants and to see trees and to talk about brooks and things. So I'm, I'm, I already got this in my mind, but you know, I'm, you know, right now I want to see the big light. <laughs> or look at these buildings. I even got caught up in these buildings, you know? Stone and steel, you know? I don't, without knowing it, I'm trying to see myself through the eyes of my oppression. I had to back off of that. Yeah. And listen to it. Even though I'm not a Muslim, I always say this. I am forever grateful to the honor of Elijah Muhammad and to Malcolm X for teaching us the importance of being black. The, important, the divine importance of being black. Right? That was a very important point for me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a student at UCLA when I'm getting all into this, you know? So I'm, I'm, I'm just glad to leave that place and go listen to the march when they used to talk rough. You know what I mean? I don't know if y'all ever went to an early boss meeting, but it was serious, you know, about black people. And what happens here, black people, and I'm going to close out here because I think I've given you uh, <laughs> What, what was important is that we remembered who we were and we learned to appreciate ourselves in a whole different way. Without the nation, I'm not sure where the black movement would be. That's right. When it's right. in the 60s. Right. And we sometimes forget that. We don't have to be a Muslim to give people credit. That's right. Just like we don't have to be Christian to give people credit. I give King credit. I give Malcolm credit. I give Fatty Lou Heyman. Most of the people that are our ancestors are all Christian. We might not be Christian, but we have to give them credit for what they've done and what they brought as African people. And so I think it's important what the end there. I want to just say, um, let me just end it. I have this last thing. I want to talk about racism, but I'm not. I want to end by saying the whole thing is. <laughs> Four, five things always when we do this. Education, mobilization, organization, and confrontation leads to tragedy. We've got to study black people. We've got to learn. We've got to make sure we understand the issues. And we've got to go to the people, start with what they know, build on what they have, including themselves. Right? You'll see they have a, 
an infinite resource of knowledge. We got to appreciate our people. We got to listen to their narrative that Nina gave up the top we just say in the project village literature. We got to listen to them. We got to let them tell their narrative because they know about food. I was reading because I was preparing for this lecture, I was reading on how black farmers and other third world farmers have been farming this land. We don't even have that history. But in this in this new village, in this new project, that history will be revived, retrieved, yes. and used as a foundation to continue this producing food for ourselves, healthy food, shared food. Okay? And then of course we need to mobilize, keep people active. Yes. We need to structure them in terms of making them self-conscious agents of their own life and liberation and organization. Y'all got to belong to organization. It's so easy just to come and listen, but I need you to organize and get in, in, in a structure. There is no substitute for organizing and engaged people constantly involved in a multiplicity of activity to define, defend, and advance their interests. And then finally, you got to confront. Confront means you intervene and interrupt. You got to intervene in the things done as just normal business. People can't just kill you and shoot you and just get along with it. You got to interrupt that. You got to intervene in that. You got to interrupt that. Not let them do business as usual. You can work out how you want to do that, but you got to do that. And then finally, of course, that's transformation. You become self-conscious agent of your own life. Let me close by saying our ultimate aim and not just to eat better, but also to live better. Come on. And that means bringing and strengthening and expanding the food sovereignty movement and linking it to the larger movement for racial and social justice in this country. It means building the unity and struggle with other oppressed, neglected, underserved, and exploited peoples and communities. It means working to change policy and eliminate regulation, law, policy, practices, institutions, and dominant culture norms uh, and ways of thinking that privilege and empower by race and class and gender and other biosocial attributes. And it means an inclusive collaboration and imagining and building on the narratives and lessons of the past, the immediate experience of the present, and the aspirations for a future. All of these extracting our best ideas and practice. For this is our duty to know our past and honor it, to engage our present and improve it, and to imagine a whole new future and to forge it in the most ethical, effective, and expensive way. Assigned to you. Okay, uh, and thank you all again. Another strong round of applause for Dr. Duran. What we'd like to do now is uh, uh, take some questions or comments from the floor, but uh, Ms. Boss is going to come back because we're, I, I want to start with the first question, I hope that if I could. One of the things that's happening is that our managing director, you indicated with Diane Moss, has been working tirelessly to raise money, right? And a lot of us don't have the $100,000 that we need. We don't have those 1000 people spending $20 a, uh, uh, what is it, a day at this point. So we have to go and deal with the government and corporate entities. And so my, I would like to ask you, what, based on what you were saying, especially about taking the seat at the table, how are we to engage the people who, are, who have this money and might want more than what they uh, deserve to get or forgive them? No, please what you say about this thing, Greg. It's a couple of uh, entities like the San Diego Gas and Electric, for yeah. example, or maybe even the city council. Right? Sometimes they want to do things for us, for them, right? Mm -hmm. But they want their low on it, they want to change the narrative. How do we, uh, when we're engaged in that kind, of, that kind of discussion and dialogue, how do we stay true to what, we, what you bless you on today in terms of things, stay on the point about the struggle that we do? Right. Appreciate what you said, Ryan, and Greg. First of all, all public space, city council, uh, 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 California Assembly and Senate, the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives and Senate, all public wealth, we have right to. So we don't have to feel funny about doing that. Also, these other places, these corporations, they owe us money, right? Now, the problem is 
not letting them put their stamp on your work. When they fund Jewish structures, you don't see their name. You have to find a way to give them a plaque over here or something. You know what I mean? Have, have some kind of plaque over there where everybody, put them in the midst of everybody else so it's just another person. Whenever they can put their stamp and it's like they did it and they give you so much money, they feel that cripples you and makes you unable to ever break from them or to act independently then you should stay away from that, right? It's always better to raise it from the community. But a lot of times the community doesn't have immediate money. And so you search for others. But whatever you do, you've got to maintain your self-determination or you end up not proposing a radical solution to the food uh, crisis, but only a reformist one, right? And only success in one space while the rest of the people go hungry and powerless. So you have to watch for that. To what you call to my attention that when I'm talking about immigration, I didn't mention all the groups that are in the immigration that we should talk about. I just talked about Haiti because Haiti means a lot to us as African people, you know, because of the revolution. It was the only one in history where enslaved people defeated their enslavers and set up a republic and then helped Latin America to get free. And it was a model for Africans and Africans in this country who went to Haiti. So Haiti is a special country. But Haiti is also one of the most abused countries in the world today, yes. right? And like other people can get in and they have large structures that can advertise for them, Haiti doesn't. So I, I tended to mention them. And I mentioned Latino as an example of the, what the Europeans now use as the goals, uh, the main focus of immigration. And I've been working with Latinos to get them, if they want my support, they got to mention Africans, African from the continent, let me just say, African from the continent, and of the Caribbean, and anywhere else Africans are migrating from. And the second, we should also keep in mind Native American. Because the Europeans drew borders that separated Native American communities. So uh, the, there's an immigration issue, say for the Yaki, across the border right here in San Diego. They, they, some of them are here in the U.S., some of them in Mexico. There was no border before all of this was there, you see? So there's an issue, there's an immigration issue that larger. I think black people are the ones that raise this. That's right. We've seen other people not going to raise this. We're rescuing them about mom, right? So we have to raise for our people, and we have to raise for the most vulnerable. The Hosea Sacred Text of Ancient Egypt tells us we are morally obligated to bear witness to truth and to set the scales of justice in a proper place among those who have no voice. That is to say, the vulnerable, the devalued, the poor, and the less powerful. Okay, anyone else have a question, a comment, Jermaine, to what we've been talking about? I see I see you back there, Sister Marie. I see your, your brain wearing. You got, because I know you're engaged in this. Anyone got any questions? Or? I, I just want to say, All right. uh, I've been here. asking about what uh, we met many, many years ago, uh, Rites of Passage. Okay. But what I want to say is that... Uh, What's your name? Anthony Aki. Right. Thank you. As far as the food and the planting, I grew up in the garden with my mother. Pretty much like you grew up on a farm. My yeah. grandparents were sugar cane farmers. And wherever I go, I encourage people, even if it's a tomato plant on your windowsill. Yes. You plant that. Yes. I encourage people to, uh, my neighbors, I encourage my neighbors, you plant tomatoes, I plant okros, you plant, and we share them together. In my neighborhood where I live, uh, sometimes I would come on, I would find a big bag of tomatoes on my door. Yes. I would take a bag of peaches to my neighbor door. Uh -huh. if, we, if we grow, because we don't have acres of palm, if we grow in our yard what food we can, we can share with each other. And we know we're building it organically, we're growing it organically. And also that we should learn how to grow. You know, corn is an easy staple to grow. Tomato, side, uh, these things that in the market are very expensive. We can grow them in a box in our kitchen window. So we must take the initiative to help feed ourselves. Yeah. And uh, this is my grandson, and I am 
fortunate that I have the opportunity to come and sit here with him. Mm. So that hopefully, whether he goes and raw tomato or not, he can't say we didn't say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. You see these young children here, they would not be able to say that somebody didn't show or tell them. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> another thing you said earlier about rights and responsibility. We have the right to everything as human beings, but we have a responsibility as to how we exercise our rights. For example, I have the right to say what I want, but I have the responsibility to how it affects you. Right. And so we teach them these things in the foundations, and mostly uh, when you get up in the morning and you see your garden blooming, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. Right. You said what you said, Ron I, I agree with everything you said. What I want to do is reconceptualize it from a community and African point. And I want to say that whatever you do personally, it's not the same as or substitute for doing things as a community. In the final analysis, one of the reasons why we can't keep the traditions that we have going is because as a result of the black freedom struggle and the leadership from the integrationist leadership, we lost a sense of community. And people convinced us we didn't need the black community. We need to escape that and go somewhere else. And what I'm arguing is I thrived in the black community. I thrived in the black school, right? I had a strong sense of myself. That's, that's why I got my grounded. That's what gave me the ability to do what I'm doing now. And I'm saying to you, uh, Brother Aki, and all the people here, <coughs> teach your children not only what you know, but teach them to link themselves with larger structures yeah. so that the community is strengthened. So I believe in family and community. Family and community. So we learn in family and community. We teach in family and community. We share in family and community. So what you're teaching about the tomatoes and about the garden, if you're just teaching it after a while, because teenagers go through a rebellion period, they're just saying, well, he's saying that, but. Yeah. But if everybody is right. there's right. no incentive, or if there's a community trust for that, it's hard to avoid, right? And if you see the strong community, Right? You see people talking in the personal, they talk community values. We need community values. That's good for you to have that value, but if nobody has it but you, it looks strange. I'm telling you, no matter how good it is, it looks strange. Right? It's just, I'll give you an example. One time, black people was really dressed. They liked their dress. You look at them old tapes, the old movies. Mm -hmm. The Commodores, the, uh, uh, the Temptations, the Four Tops, yeah. the uh, Supremes, they be dressed. You see what they wear now? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> because guess what? We gave up being black. And, and you know, you know, now this is cold what I'm going to say, but I don't mean it in any disparity. Africans love color, yeah. but there's a different between being colorful and clownish. Mm. Mm. I'm not gonna say it, enough say it. You know what I'm saying? Enough say it. Brother Wallace, can you come on? Knowing you off and on throughout the year, yes. we look back 1960s to when the black struggle uh, my name is Henry Wallace. I'm chairman of the San Diego Original Black Panther Party uh -huh. for community empowerment. Chief. Recently reactivated for the purpose of reestablishing our history here in the city. Yes. No one remembered us. And so instead of them telling our story, I had to come out and tell our story. Chief. Since then, we uh, went back to our social program, which is feeding. Uh -huh. So uh, I had hooked up with Diane, but 
the skinny guy, and I went there one day, and he wasn't there, so that's why I had to get back. But I'll get back with you. Uh, we give out food. See, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. They're smooth. Talking it right out of the That part. That part. Yeah. But anyhow, we give out food to low-income families. Okay. Three times, three days a week. Okay. In San Diego, we have hundreds of people Jeez. that we give food to now. That's good. We're over at the San Diego Elks, the, the last black-owned Elks in San Diego. Yeah. So on Tuesday, we give out food at 11 a.m. We give it out at that Elks as symbolism yeah. that we must maintain our black institution. So we're going back to try and establish some things. I would love to have conversation with you be glad in you. the near future because we're doing something that you might be interested in. I'm just glad yeah. you. So if you guys want to know more about what we're doing, go to Facebook Henry L. Wallace and you'll know the days and times that we give our food. Okay. They made me take down the Black Panther Party symbol back in the days when they were trying to uh, make sure that there's no radical groups on the uh, internet. But now I have put in my name, so I'm proud to be a Black Panther. I put my name out there. And real Wallace. Okay, well, and again, I want to stress the same thing. Build a coalition with Nanya Cable and Tom Boozy with Project New Village. So you have an overarching project. Everybody keeps, this is what we call in the 60s, we introduced the concept of operational unity, unity and diversity. We keep our own identity. But we find common ground and we stand on that. Right. We all want to serve our people. That's common ground. We all know unity is important. That's common ground. We all know we got to struggle. That's common ground. So ask yourself, what is the common ground on which we sit? We, 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 we act. And then build that coalition. Uh, really, with us, our line, coalition with other people. But uh, 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 some people, we can build lines with other people. But, <laughs> yeah. You know, I make a distinction between coalition and alliance. Coalition is a short-term association based on, you know, uh, a common, uh, 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 an immediate project. Once you get over that, you might not even work together again, right? That's coalition. But alliance is a long-term association based on mutual commitment to similar or common principles, right? Those people have long. Therefore, we. I told a person this other day. They thought they were talking black. They say we don't have no permanent. Friends and no permanent allies, only permanent interests. He thought that was black. That's really your big. Why wouldn't you have a permanent friend? What's wrong with you? You can't maintain relationship? <laughs> and I've got a permanent enemy. My oppression. Yes. I mean, why wouldn't I? See, that's what makes them able to work with the oppressor. Just call them a friend. Hey. That's what makes them make the wrong choice, calling a friend an enemy. Garvey said, half of education is knowing who your enemy and your friend are. Half of education. Half of it. I like that. We, we got a rich history, y'all. Just got to get in there and talk about it. You know? All right. Brother Kamal, and then you, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Dr. Brent, can you share some ideas, tactics, tools, or strategies uh, that Project New Village or other people in the room could employ to engage black people to get a little closer to farming and agriculture. It's a contentious relationship in history for, for many obvious reasons, while many of us still do have fond memories of grandparents and elders with gardens and growing up with a connection to land. Uh, we've experienced significant difficulty making the case that this is an appropriate or good thing to do. Uh, what are some historical examples perhaps you could share that we could employ uh, instead of recreating the wheel? So to reclaim that heritage and that birthright and become producers again and not just consumers, like you mentioned. Appreciate what you said, if I understand correctly. It's so important. I, I'm going to go over this again and again because it's so important for us to come together and solve these issues, to build a common, a common approach to teaching our people. What's the curriculum for teaching our people to appreciate this? All of y'all in this room that got experience, guess what it would mean if you came together and agreed on a curriculum? A way of teaching this, some basic talking points, and then you go back and talk. 
And then the voice becomes a unified voice. And it becomes a persistent and pervasive voice. But now we're all doing good, but we're doing good in isolation. The synergy comes when we link ourselves. And we plan regularly, weekly, you know, every two weeks, but no later than every month. Otherwise, you know, we get lost. <laughs> Better every week. So I'm saying that's what I would do. We can read all these things and we can teach. But teaching by yourself, I always see the importance of the organization. I, look, it's just so important to have organization. See, words are good, but practice is divine. And the first practice in the seven principles, because every principle must turn into a practice if it's real. Right. The first principle mm -hmm. in the seven principles is umoji. Mm -hmm. You know why that's first and not second or seventh? Because without umoji, you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. Seventh is faith, because without faith, you can't sustain what you're doing, right? You got to have faith in the people. You got to have faith in what you're doing, right? right? That's right. So I'm saying to y'all that, yes, I can enumerate, enumerate, two, one, two, three, four. You know one of the things I'd like to do when y'all finally get this? I sure hope y'all be developing. I would like to teach on George Washington Carver's approach oh, yeah. to plan. Yeah. I'm thinking of this beautiful conversation. You know, he was like real spiritual and very much into believing that we should honor the creation because it's sacred from the hand of God. And how he said that, you know, you have to love nature. And if you love nature, the plants, the trees, the water, the rock, it'll give up its secret like every lover does. <laughs> like the hill, like the wind. <laughs> So I would, I would like to teach him what George Washington does. Because most people tell him, oh, he did something with the peanut. But actually, he was an environmentalist before we had the word. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But we got to teach that. What an example. Y'all see, when I reckon, it was almost like, I knew that. But you didn't know. Oh, but just to be honest with you, you didn't. You knew it, but you didn't. You know, there's something called knowing but not knowing. Yeah. That means you just sense it. And when it's said, good. It's almost like a revelation. Oh, there it is. So I just want us to study more. Yes. I'm, 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 I'm into studying. I'm into learning. I will learn all my life. I would never feel I have enough knowledge. I always want something else. And I want y'all to feel that. And I want you to communicate to our children. Right. And you'll be an example. Better than a lecture is an example. Come on. If you do the garden and you involve them without saying, you got to do this. No, just involve. Sometimes, if you, if you tell, see, I, I always wanted, tell me what you can tell you. I have a habit, and I, I can't even stop myself now. I'm just into it. I want people to understand everything I know right now. Right now. <laughs> I guess myself this afternoon. You know what I mean? Okay. But you can't teach people all you know in a day or a year or a decade. Mm -hmm. You've got to let people learn as they live. Mm -hmm. right. And you got to live with them. You got to work with them. And when you work with them, you can talk to them. So if I'm going to teach my daughter about, our daughter, rather, our daughter about, um, uh, uh, and that's collective, you know, because people can say mine all the time. So, anyhow. See, let me tell you this. See how I chose to say how yeah. we say in our organization now? We are American by habit and African by choice. Uh -huh. You normally say my. American says my, but it's ours, right? So now, if I want our daughter to learn gardening better than a lecture and a telling her is to start the garden and ask her to plant this. Without even, without even justification for why it is. After it grows, the two is been pretty. <laughs> well, we try this over here. Get people involved in the practice of doing good in the world, of bringing beauty in the world. 
then they can learn. If it's just an isolated lesson, people are going to resist it. First of all, they don't want to admit they don't know something. Whether it's your children or your cousin. Right? They don't want to think. But if you just go on and do it, do this, do this. Or tell them something you like. Tell them how beautiful it is to plant a garden, see your tomatoes grow. That's it. Now, don't you do it? No. Look, I would you think about that. You want to try to do this? Oh, no, I don't want to. Okay, good. But keep coming back. Now, there's some place, but our daughter would tell you this. At some point, you're going to have to give directions. Yeah. But I don't want to give you this. You know, with the European, the daughter went upstairs and you got one. You know that. Close the door and lock your house. Yeah. We're not into that, right? So we got to give directions. Right. At what point we got to get that? You can't be oppressive, but we got to get direction. You can always question the rightness of your decision, but you should never question your right to make it. Yeah. You should never question your right to give your children good advice. Otherwise, what are you there for if you turn yourself into an ATM machine? Mm -hmm. They don't need you unless they need money. Huh? I was kind of long on that. Uh, uh, Billy Johnson, um, that's what I was going to stress is that the importance of food for the soul is like a lost art. We were losing our, our grandmama the way the way they used to cook it, our mama yes. the, way they, the way they used to cook it, or just making the food taste so so good. Yeah, and I, we just got to take that extra chance and, 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 and make our kids learn. But I'm, I'm just saying, just, just like you touched on, about our soul food and the losing someone else. We need to reach out and try to, you know, hey, mama, how, how, how you cook, cook, cook that, that, that rice? Or yeah. you know, dirty rice or mm -hmm. young bull? Or, yeah. You know, <coughs> that's, that's right. That's no, that's, that's an excellent point because I appreciate what you said about the same thing. Tomorrow you can tell you, I, 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 I do most of the cooking in the house. And I bring in my mother. You know, she cooked too, but I bring in this uh, this whole array that my mother used. And I, when I don't remember all of it, I call my older sister and I ask her, why do we do that? You know? But some things I can't remember, you know? But I had to cook, because I'm on a farm. I had to cook when I'm like five, six, seven months early. We had to cook. You know, you, you know, cook, you trouble. Because people's out in the field. So you learn how to do these things. And you learn them out of necessity, but you also learn them because when you watch your mama cook and she gives you some of it for it's done, before it's served, that's an yeah. added thing. You know, I'm learning. I'm learning. That's right. That's right. We have to have incentives. We have to give our children incentives to learn and teach them, cultivate, instead of saying, make them cultivate in them appreciation for these things that we love and know. That's what you're doing, and I appreciate that. Yeah. That's what we all should do. All right, Mr. Healy, do you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, and before you go, can I just say this? I, I, as Dr. Graham was talking, I'm looking at the children that are here, and yeah. I think that they need to be given a round of applause. Yeah, all right, y'all. Right. Right. And we need to value them. And one of the things I've learned from being around Dr. Graham all these years is that there's no better time than right now to start doing something that's different. And for them to see it, to know that these people are doing this to help them and to make them feel better. And I really want to give you a lot of credit for what you've been doing. So now you can ask your question. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, I, 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 my, my name is Dwayne Dwayne Hill. Uh, okay. I, 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 I come from a long legacy of men of the earth. You know, we come to the earth and grow many things. But in here now in time, uh, you know, as you feed the body, you, you have to, I mentioned, I heard you mention education, education, education. Yes. And uh, we have to feed our minds. So I brought my grandkids, uh, grandson, our grandson, our grandson, our grandson. Um, you know, um, because on a daily basis we we practice our education. And I'm going to have them to take a picture with you. And I would like if you can leave a question on them, uh, how important, or which is uh, something that they can reflect on 20, 30 years from now. You know, because uh, 
that's what I do when my mom and my dad said, I told you so. And then when I get older, I said, she told me so. And it came to pass. So I, I want you to uh, get a, a touch of revelation where, you know, you know they're going to say, I told you so, because you told them so. You get it? Okay. Yes. And they will have a picture to reflect on 30, because they're going to take a picture with you. Oh, yeah. you know, You're going to ask me that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Planting is good for our earth and not buying our faith in Jesus. I didn't hear you. He said planting is good for our health and it's not buying our faith in Jesus. Okay. Alright. Thank you. And I want you to remember this. That the struggle is not simply to eat better, but to live better. Amen. And eating is one part of living, but it's not all. And we have to develop a life of the mind like we have a life in society or in our community. So the struggle is not simply to eat better, but to live better. All right? Remember that? Okay. So, sir, what did you, what did you learn from all this? What's your name first? Oh, JBR. JBR? JBR. 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 Thank you, JBR. Uh, I learned that um, we got to, um, we need to attach to them so you can let go. I So, so one of the things I want to do, and this is one of the things I want y'all to do with your young men, especially. Because the devil has beaten down the black man. I'm just saying this. Now, you can make the devil whoever you want. You know what I mean? But what they've done is made us quieter than we ought to be in situations of importance. We're loud outside, but we're not loud inside. And I want us to be loud inside. This is our space. That's right. So I want you to just talk up. I know it's hard for you, but I want you to do that. If you could just talk up and tell me that. Because what you're saying is important. And I want you to appreciate what you say. This is a good thing. People be encouraging you to say bad things. But I want to encourage you to say good things. And what you said, part of what I heard of it, was good. So I want to hear all of it. So would you do it again for me, please? Yeah, we have to forgive people. Just a little bit louder. We have to um That's right. We have to practice. We have to build community and practice together, so we can do better in our life. That's that's a strong. That's at the core of everything I said. Community. We've got to build a community stronger. Because if the community is stronger, we become stronger. If our community is weak, we'll be weak. And if we're weak, our community will be weak. It's an interrelated kind of thing that one builds and strengthens the other. Family strengthens the nation, and the nation strengthens the family, right? The family strengthens the community, and the community strengthens the family. So this is very good. Thank you. Sign to sign. Let's give a give an instruction. Let's pray for you again. Father, we love you. We love you. Okay, good. Good. Are you going to go to college? Yeah. Who are you going to study? Business? Okay, good. Tell us your GPA. We'll need you. Uh, 3.85. 3.85? Good. Give me a All right, so. And so, look at that. So, see, now this is what I'm talking about community. Once you get your business degree, you might work for a project in New Zealand yeah. and help them 
to keep their boots straight. Yeah. And you know what's terrible about that? It? It'll be helping them, listen, it'll be helping them to keep in the black. That's right. And you know, you know that's, what, that's the only good thing in the English language that's black, right? Yeah. So because they had the books, uh, David and and uh, Jordan. 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 So yes. Jamie and Jordan, the, the reason they say is if you're in the black, that means you've got profit, is because they used to do the books in black ink. And when they wanted to show a loss, they put it in red. Mm -hmm. So that's how Black Friday and all that came. This is the Friday for profit, right? Yeah, yeah. But they're not talking about us, but we'll take it in. We make it real. So you can keep the, uh, the project in the village in the black, you know, with your business guys. You know what I mean? You make it develop and do it. So I look forward to that. Just one more hand for the young man. Okay. Uh, were there any other questions? Comments? Uh, one quick comment. Uh, Elder, so, uh, Baba. Let, ask a question. Uh, Could you ask a question? Yeah. I want to make a comment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I can ask a question. Yeah. Yeah. But look, no, I've always told people that based on our condition as black people in America today, that the most significant contribution to African people in America in the 20th century was the advent of quantum. I've always tried to share that the reason for me saying that is because it helps us to rebuild the culture and the institutions that was taken away from us post-slavery. Mm -hmm. And I strongly believe that the community that we are trying to build, or that we must be built and we are building, is the, is the foundation for that. And we must push it more because I am seeing it subsiding. And how could we push it more? I know we can get together, we can have Kwanzaa every day. We used to have a Kwanzaa forever here in San Diego. Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa forever. Kwanzaa here in San Diego was, what happened, those were the times when I looked like these brothers and Tambuzi and Nini Kebu, we are, time has passed and a lot of us have now become elders and some of us have passed on and some of us, so we have to regenerate, even with the garden project, the harvest project, the institution of Kwanzaa, which I feel is the foundation for everything we are seeing here today. Can I? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I wanted to, but did you want to say something? No. Yeah, I can wait. Is it on this? Yeah. Okay, you go first. Yeah. Now, let me sum it up. Right. One of the things I want us to do, because we're not, this is not what Dr. Karenga has taught us in us, our organization does. This is not an episodic engagement. Right. This is a, our gathering, we want to do this on an ongoing basis. And so <coughs> you had mentioned uh, uh, Kwanzaa, and I wanted to let you know that there were, I don't know, I'm going to be able to see Yeah, I'll be fine. So we have, uh, uh, the authentic Kwanzaa book that Dr. Karenga authored, we have it here, he's going to be willing to sign it, so that's, that will be available. But we're also, uh, many people and I talked about this, and now that we're just talking about it, that we might be looking at bringing Dr. Karenga back uh, for Kwanzaa uh, this, this year as part of some of the organizing efforts. And we really want your support, right? Well, I will help sponsor that. Huh? You know, I really, we really <laughs> want your support to tell people, tell 10 other people. And I also want to tell you, Mr. Aki and other colleagues, that as we're getting older, we're being, not replaced, but there are other younger people who are coming in and keeping the, the holiday alive all across the country and here in San Diego too. So we're still here to lay the foundation to be the advisors, to be the people, the, the sages, so to speak. But we do have a lot of young people. Our board chair, Kamal, is a young man. America, we got a lot of young people who are doing this and continuing this tradition. So I wanted to make sure that we knew that and stay lifted based on the conversation that we've been having this afternoon. Okay. 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 what you said about saying great. Then I want you to take this in a good spirit. One of the things we've got to do if we want Kwanzaa to advance, we've got to we've got to show it as a historically created holiday. If we say, and, and I'm not criticizing you, I'm saying if we say the event of Kwanzaa, two things happen. It's like it dropped. 
So I mean, Advent. Advent. What'd you say? Advent. Advent. Yeah, I said, did I say Advent? Advent, yeah, yeah okay. Advent. I'm All saying, right. but listen to what I'm saying. Okay. It's like the Advent of Jesus. It's almost a magical thing. Okay, right, right. It's not a magical thing. It came from intellectual creativity out of the struggle. And it came from the values of Kwanzaa, uh, 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 the, uh, the Nguzo Saba. Kwanzaa, I created Kwanzaa. It's important to say that because a lot of times, People deny black children and black people a model of creativity. Garvey said what humans have done, humans can do. Maybe they can't create a quantity like I did, but they can create something of beauty and value. And if you deny them a reference point, if you pretend like your ancestors did something, or it just happened, and you don't show how someone had to study. I had to study. I learned many languages. I learned many cultures, and I had to put that together as a coherent practice, right? And I did it as a result of the movement, in the movement. We, I, I left UCLA, I was at UCLA at the beginning of the movement, right? And I, when, when the transition from uh, civil rights phase of the black freedom movement to the black power phase of the uh, black movement, the white man has done changed our black freedom movement. He makes our black freedom movement just the civil rights movement which does two things, redefine what we are and diminish the importance of freedom to us, right? Reduces our struggle to just civil rights and even makes Malcolm a civil rights leader when Malcolm said, we are human rights. That's right. We got to struggle for human rights, not civil rights, right? So we don't want to do that. What I want to do is show that this is an act of freedom itself, that creation of this. This culture initiative was an act of freedom to free us from the domination of the values of the dominant society, right? To go back, as you said, and retrieve the best of what it means to be African and human and speak that special culture truth to the world. And I created Kwanzaa as a structure to do the, to, 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 to introduce these values. I created Kwanzaa for three basic reasons. One, to reaffirm our rootedness in African culture, that we were African people, that we had been lifted out of our own culture and history and made a footnote forgotten casualty in white history. And that our struggle, as Cabral said, was to return to our own history and culture. Second, I created to give us a time when we as African people could come together, reaffirm the bonds between us, speak on the beauty of African culture and meditate on the awesome meaning of being African in the world. What does it mean to be the father and mother of human civilization? What does it mean to in fact wage a struggle in this country that changed the course of this struggle and created a society even in its flaws that George Washington and Thomas Jefferson couldn't imagine and certainly couldn't accept? We as a people talk more about being African and about struggle than any other time during the year. Yeah. And, I and all over the world, let me finish, uh, and all over the world, millions of African people, yeah. millions, I said, of African people on every continent in the world celebrate Kwanzaa. Yeah. So I want us to do this. Number one, talk about the context in which Kwanzaa is created and the creative Kwanzaa and what must have been going on in his mind. Second, talk about the values. Teach the Nguzo Saba, right? Third, don't let the white man get you talking about how Kwanzaa's not growing and how small. He does that every year. Talk about Kwanzaa's growth all over the world. We get pictures, internet, uh, we get, what do you call it, emails. I do interviews with people on different continents about Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa's not dying, it's growing. What we need to do is play our part in this continued expansion. And we have to have, as Molefi Asante said, a victorious consciousness. And we gotta talk victories, and don't let the European get us talking about diminished capacity. The last thing, the last Sorry. thing, uh, the last thing, get out, get, listen, y'all, I need you to do this, and I, I, I quit. I want y'all to do this. 
I want you to involve the youth without diminishing your own role. Yes. yes. I get tired of older people rendering themselves irrelevant. Why are we doing that? We got a role to play. Actually, I'm, you know, I, I don't think any of you can play more role than me. So I'm a different kind of person, right? But I think that people who believe they're finished or believe they need to sit to the side, that's not real. That's not African. The elders also have a role. Yes. You can buy, you, as, 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 uh, Lincoln, you tell the narrative. Yes. Every Kwanzaa in our Karamu, we have elders tell the narrative. Yes. We've got to do that. You have to be open. Don't ever say, baby, it's your turn. Baby don't even know it's their turn, right? <laughs> Baby got to be taught, cultivated, to appreciate the historical role they played. Again, I say to you, teach the values, teach the history and the struggle, and involve young people without diminishing your own importance and role. Finally, go to build this. Again, here's Project New Village. Why can't we be there and create? We got in Los Angeles called Kwanzaa Uchima Collective, in which we plan events for the city. So everybody that's on this committee, they take a night that they want to do Kwanzaa in the seven years. Y'all can do the same thing. We used to do it. Why not? I must say, I, 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 I humbly stand corrected to using that word advent. Because as I said, it's been created. And, and I do stand strong in, in, in passing this along. Um, so, oh, I took my weapon. That's good. I, I thank you for saying that. Can I ask that. you that, though? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you say, Asante to you, Dr. Karinga, for creating it? Asante to you, Dr. Karinga, for creating it. On behalf of me and all my generations. <laughs> I'm finished. So, oh. so here, here's how, what I want to do, say to you. This is how we end our meetings a lot of time in the organization us. My organization is us. Us, us is symbolic of three things. One, commitment to the priority of the people. Second, commitment to opposition to our oppressor and our oppressor. And third, a commitment to a community and African way of life. So when we say us, that's, we mean all those things. So in our, our organization, us, we say this. At the end of our um, um, event, a lifetime, this is my message to you. Continue the struggle. Continue the struggle. Keep the faith. Keep, Keep the, the faith. faith. Hold the line. Hold, Hold the, the line. line. Love our people and each other. Love our people and each other. Seek and speak truth. Seek and speak truth. Do and demand justice. Do and demand justice. Be constantly concerned. Be constantly concerned with the well-being of the world. With the well-being of the world. And all in. And all in. And dare help build. And dare help build. And rebuild. And rebuild. The overarching move. The overarching movement that prefigures, that prefigures, and makes possible, and makes possible the good world, the good world, world we all want and deserve. We all want and deserve. Let's close out with Harambe. And thanks again, Brother Anthony, for saying that I too believe that's a turning point and a central message of uh, the struggle. We close our meeting the way we have for 54 years. This is our 54th anniversary. And we say it by saying seven Harambe. Harambe is a Swahili word that means let's all pull together. And surely to build the good world we all want and deserve to live in, we must pull together. And when we say it, we put our hand up in the air like this and pull it out seven times for the Nguzo Saba, the seven principles. The seven principles of Kwanzaa, the seven principles of Kawita philosophy. We see these principles as a moral minimum set of values that black people need in order to rescue and reconstruct their history and humanity and shape them in their own image and nature. We believe that black people can practice just some of these principles. Some of the time, a whole new change will come in their lives. And those principles, first in Swahili and then in English, repeat after me both. 
are umoja. Umoja. Unity. Unity. Kujichangulia. Kujichangulia. Self-determination. Uchima. Uchima. Collective work and responsibility. Collective work and responsibility. Ujama. Ujama. Cooperative economics. Cooperative economics. Nia. Nia. Purpose. Purpose. Uva. Uva. Creativity. Creativity. Any mind. Any mind. Faith in ourselves, black people. Faith in our creator. Faith in our mothers, our fathers, our sisters, our brothers, our grandmothers, and grandfathers. Our elders, our youth, our future. Faith in all that makes us beautiful and strong. And faith in the righteousness and victory of our cause. Faith that through hard work, long struggle, and a whole lot of love and understanding, we can again step back on the stage of human history as a free, Proud and productive people. Last one, draw it out as long as you can. Charlie, too. Harambe! Harambe! Harambe!